panel is uh, about the remedies in case of uh, non-performance of obligations. I am happy that uh, we have a real uh, international company of, of speakers. Uh, uh, I will, uh, you can look uh, at this uh, list of speakers that, uh, uh, that uh, Russia is uh, represented by, by four speakers. Equally, Moscow and uh, the speakers by two speakers. Then, uh, then Great Britain, Germany, Belgium, Estonia. I will uh, introduce uh, speakers a uh, bit uh, more uh, prior to uh, representations. Actually, the next slide uh, is uh, just a um, uh, list of. Uh, of uh, of main remedies. Um, <clears throat> we uh, will deal with, with system of, of uh, system of remedies, and you can look at this slides uh, list of remedies: right to enforce performance, withholding performance, price reduction, damages, interest in in uh, um, uh, in uh, late payment, termination, penalty. And we may uh, we try to cover all aspects of, of these uh, these uh, various um, uh, various remedies. We may say that uh, among these remedies are two pillars, two main uh, kinds of, of remedies. Uh, this is uh, specific performance, damages, and termination. The, the main attention will be. Uh, draw uh, to these uh, remedies. We try to, to analyze uh, remedies from point of, of national legislation to compare how the remedies have been, uh, have been uh, regulated in, in various uh, countries. And, and that's why I am happy that, that uh, various countries are, are very well represented here. And at the same time, we try to, to compare the remedies uh, of national legislation to the remedies, uh, to the provisions on the remedies in, in DCFA. DCFA is common, draft, uh, common frame of reference, with other words, uh, this is a draft on, on uh, model uh, rules of European uh, private uh, law. E European private law means, uh, first of all, uh, law on obligation uh, from, uh, on, on that uh, <coughs> con uh, contest. And, um, you are free to, to ask questions, uh, quick questions after every uh, presentation, and then I hope that we'll have time uh, in the very end uh, for, in, for, for the intervention, uh, when somebody would like to say something in addition, or ask a uh, question. Uh, uh, and then the speakers uh, may, may, uh, may answer them. So, let's start. Uh, our uh, first uh, speaker will be uh, will be uh, um, Christian Schmies. He's a partner of, of well-known German uh, law firm Hengeler and Müller. Uh, he has uh, got master of art, uh, of art uh, in international relations. He has P uh, PhD in, in, in law. His special areas are banking regulation, asset management, security regulation, and he's member of Engeler Müller as a Russian desk uh, uh, as well. Uh, uh, so, Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, everybody? Is that okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, so I'm essentially covering uh, the right to enforce, pen, uh, to enforce performance uh, as provided for under the uh, DCFR, um, kind of one of the basic uh, remedies. Um, is it? Okay, some more. Okay, well, a little bit small, but uh, I'm going through it anyway. Um, what, what, maybe what, what is performance uh, to start with under the DCFR? Well, I mean, the basic definition is fairly, the general definition is fairly, fairly basic and straightforward. 
uh, the DCR, DCFR says performance is the doing by the debtor of what is to be done under the obligation or the not doing by the debtor of what is not to be done. So a fairly generic uh, definition which shows that performance under the DCFR covers both positive and negative obligations, i.e. the obligation to do something but also uh, the obligation to omit uh, doing something. The DCFR, beyond this general provision, contains a number of provisions which specify in further detail how performance is to be uh, done. And that relates in particular to uh, aspects like place of performance, time of performance, uh, and also performance by a third party, i.e. under what conditions the debtor is not obliged to perform the obligation personally, uh, but may also have the obligation performed by a, by a third party. And in all that, it must be taken into consideration that the whole DCFR is based on the principle of party autonomy. Um, that means the parties are generally free to decide to exclude the application of certain provisions of the uh, DCFR uh, relating co contracts unless the DCFR provides otherwise, which it does in, in, in certain respects. And that also applies to the remedy or to, to, to the question of whether the debtor is under an obligation to uh, I mean, uh, do specific performance. Uh, i.e. the parties can exclude the obligation to specific performance, but they can also broaden uh, the scope of application of, of scope of uh, specific performance. And there's one interesting aspect where I think probably, I mean, further, further analysis is required or, or simply it needs to show how uh, this turns out in, in, in practice. The, the right or the op option to extend the scope of specific performance is limited by another provision in the DCFR which says that to the extent that matters relating primar primarily to procedure or enforcement are touched, the principle of party autonomy obviously does not apply, which is, I mean, in a way uh, kind of obvious because how then an obligation is enforced or the actual procedure of enforcing is rather a question of civil procedure uh, because ultimately, uh, I mean, each obligation, I I if the debtor doesn't perform, someone needs to be informed typically by, by public uh, coercion. And depending on the legal system, obviously, uh, the, the rules of civil procedure or the rules of enforcement may not uh, uh, provide for the tools for courts or whatever are the relevant public uh, entities to actually enforce a procedure. I mean, in Germany, we have a fairly elaborate system of how various types of obligations can be enforced, but you may uh, imagine a, a jurisdictions in which that is not the case or which takes different approaches. For example, how do you enforce an obligation to consent to something or to make a declaration? I mean, the German solution is simply that the court then does the fictitious declaration on behalf of, of the debtor who refuses to declare something. But uh, I mean, obviously you need to have a legal system which provides for these tools. Uh, and if the legal system doesn't provide for these tools or instruments, then the parties can uh, obviously not introduce such tools. So that very generic... Uh, someone doesn't move forward. Okay. Now, the right to enforce performance. Uh, I guess it's still fair to say that there are very different conceptual approaches to performance along legal systems and coming from Germany, I mean, I'm, I probably can talk best, best about the German uh, system where the right to claim specific performance is regarded as being inherent to a contractual con uh, claim. It's nothing which comes on top, but whenever parties enter in an obligation to something, the right to uh, specific performance is part of the obligation. Um, a famous German scholar has once uh, called the, the right to specific performance is the backbone of the obligation. Whereas at least, I mean, in continental European jurisdictions, we understand that the Anglo-Saxon legal system take a somewhat different approach. I guess we can talk about later whether, I mean, the difference are really that, uh, that large in, in, in practice, but at least, I mean, our understanding in, in Germany is always that the Anglo-Saxon legal systems rather regard specific performance as one of potential remedies, but not necessarily inherent to each and every contractual claim.
So with that uh, starting point, obviously the DCFR is a common European uh, set of rules. I mean, had somehow to bring together two very different, or at least two very different legal uh, traditions. Why specific performance at all? What may be the advantages or the disadvantage? Well, at least in case of unique goods, uh, the debtor, uh, the, the creditor may have a problem if there's no right to specific in, in, uh, enforcement. Um, and also other remedies may not ensure the creditor's complete satisfaction. If you only allow the creditor to collect damages, then uh, necessarily there needs to be a certain instrument or a certain technique how to calculate damages. And obviously the way how a legal system addresses this a topic may imply that the creditor may not gather the, uh, the, 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 the true value of uh, the obligation uh, to him. And then there are also more maybe philosophical aspects uh, of uh, specific performance strengthening the binding nature of contractual obligations. Now, is specific performance always uh, 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 maybe the best, best idea? Well, obviously, uh, there are also downsides to the right of specific performance. There may be a potential for abuse by the creditor, uh, insisting on specific performance uh, where uh, the, the creditor may well also uh, I mean, be completely satisfied by damages or other remedies. And then obviously there's the et eternal or at least uh, decade-old discussion on uh, efficient breach, uh, i.e. whether uh, um, a legal system has appropriate tools in place to enforce only obligations where specific performance uh, really leads to economically efficient results uh, from an overall perspective. Um, now, the DCFR uh, essentially distinguishes between two types of obligations when it comes to specific performance. That's monetary obligations and non-monetary obligations. Uh, what is a monetary obligation? Well, monetary obligation is essentially the obligation to make a payment uh, of money, which includes payments of interest or payments uh, of damages. And there the general rule is monetary obligations can always be enforced. And you may think, well, I mean, that seems like I mean, sta stating, stating the obvious, uh, which uh, in a certain sense is also stating the obvious. I think the, the more interesting aspect about the right to enforce a monetary obligation is rather under which circumstances can the debtor of the monetary obligation avoid being obliged to perform the monetary uh, obligation in case of reciprocal obligations. Simple case somebody has ordered a ship to be built um, uh, and generally at least under German law the shipbuilder would I mean have have the right to claim the payment if he performs uh, his obligation ie constructs uh, the ship now the question is under what circumstances should the debtor of the claim ie the one who has ordered the ship to be built have the right to avoid making the payment ie essentially terminating uh, the, the contract and that I mean question arises in call, case of all kinds of service contracts or, or construction uh, contracts but you can also think about it in, in terms of a simple sales contract um, so so what's the solution of the DCFR um, uh, on it well also the DCFR takes a position that the creditor is generally entitled to perform and thus to earn the full payment of the corresponding monetary obligations, but there are two exceptions. The one are cover transactions, i.e. where the creditor can make a reasonable cover transaction without significant trouble or expense, uh, he's not entitled to continue performance. And the other one is unreasonable performance, uh, where before the performance has actually begun, the debtor makes clear that performance is no longer wanted. Um, and I mean, uh, certainly a discussion whether I mean the, the the trend started by the DCFR is a step towards a general right to freely terminate contracts against against compensation, which is certainly not the approach German law would uh, I mean is based on uh, at the moment. And maybe we can discuss later whether that is is a reasonable approach. So that's that was on monetary obligations. On non-monetary obligations. Um, 
like in case of monetary obligations, uh, also non-monetary obligations can generally be enforced under the DCFR. I.e., I think it's fair to say that specific performance is regarded as a standard remedy, not an exceptional one under the DCFR. And the remedy is not qualified by the discretion of the court. Uh, it's not that the court can freely decide whether to grant uh, specific performance or not. However, the right to specific performance in case of non-monetary obligations is subject to mu uh, mu uh, uh, more widespread a catalog of exceptions and, and restrictions. And in the end, you may then think of the right to specific performance uh, in case of non-monetary obligations of being a little bit similar to a discretionary uh, uh, regime. Uh, just one side note, the right to specific performance includes the right to demand remedy free of charge in case of defective performance. In Germany for a long time we had a separate regime uh, in case of defective performance, but defects are essentially treated as partial non-performance under the DCFR. Now what are the exceptions and the limitations to the right to demand specific performance under the DCFR? Um, well, the first one seems rather obvious and is probably common to all jurisdictions. There's obviously no right to specific performance when uh, performance is unlawful or impossible. Um, but there's also no right to specific performance if performance is unreasonably burdensome or, or expensive. Um, and in that respect, uh, the DCFR actually doesn't precisely determine which factors govern the, uh, this reasonable and this tech, uh, reasonable uh, test. Uh, certainly one of the important aspects is availability of alternative sourcing. I mean, if you don't have an obligation to perform a very unique service, you may think that the value of the obligation or the value of enforcing the obligation should come fairly close to the market value of the good or service to be delivered. Uh, if the debtor can easily be replaced by a uh, the second letter, you may wonder whether it's really wise to provide for a right of specific performance or how important the right to specific performance if, is if the creditor can easily obtain the good or the service in, in the market for a similar price. Um, obviously, there are, uh, or not obviously, but interestingly, there are uh, special provisions in case of services. Um, and, and that's always also a challenge in, in, in German law. How do you enforce? personalized services where the service uh, is very much linked to a particular service uh, person. You may think that if you hire a lawyer, you want that specific lawyer to work on your file and not somebody, somebody else. And if that lawyer says, well, I simply don't do it or refuses to do it, I mean, how can you, how can you enforce a personal uh, obligation? And there the DCFR uh, I mean, uh, ma makes fairly clear that the right of to enforce specific performance is, is limited by the debtors' human rights and, and fundamental freedoms, which is obviously also a very broad concept and, and would need to be de developed and analyzed in, in further specific cir circumstances. And then an interesting uh, uh, point in the DCFR, that's my last point, the right to uh, request specific performance must be made within a, a reasonable timeline. In Germany, we have obviously general rules on when claims become time barred, but otherwise the right of specific or to enforce specific performance is not limited by time. Why may it be useful to limit the right to enforce specific performance within a reasonable time? Well, that goes back to the earlier point that specific performance may open up uh, possibilities for abuse, namely if the creditor knows that he can request both specific performance and damages, he may speculate uh, at the cost of the debtor of the, of the obligation and wait and see how the value of the good uh, uh, for which he can claim specific performance develops. And depending on the de development, he may choose either uh, the remedy of specific performance or, or damages. And that's something which uh, can probably be limited by this limitation that the uh, request for specific performance must be made within a reasonable time. So that, in a nutshell, was an overview of uh, what the DCFR says on, on specific performance. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Christian. 
Uh, do you have uh, some brief questions? Yeah, please. Вопрос можно задавать и на русском языке, конечно. Можно на русском, да? Да. Тогда и на русском. Let me do it in Russian then. For the maturity to understand it. Thank you for the interesting presentation. The question is as follows. Talking about the German law or other European jurisdictions, there is a case. How would, what would be the ruling of the court? There is a sales and purchase contract, but there is no advanced payment no advance payment and by the terms and conditions uh, the uh, seller could uh, uh, pr uh, deliver after money is paid so what would be then the court uh, uh, ruling if uh, the uh, commodity is not delivered I understand the case correctly. So the debtor's obligation to perform, i.e. to deliver the good, is only due when the payment of the purchase price. I mean, under German law, you obviously also, and that's also in the DCFR, you can only enforce specifically once the obligation becomes due. I mean, the more interesting case in Germany is rather the, the, the case where both obligations have to be performed at the same time. Uh, if the, the, the debtor is allowed to enforce, uh, to, to deliver only after payment of the purchase price, you won't get an injunction for specific performance until the pur purchase price has been, has been paid. If both have to perform at the same time, you actually can get a court order, and the person who enforces the order will only enforce the order once there's evidence that the purchase price has also been paid. But it's not that in the, that case where both obligations have to be performed at the same time, you could not uh, uh, enforce the right to specific performance. But in your case, the payment would have to be made first because you can only obtain specific performance one, once the debtor's obligation is due. I have a question. May I ask a question? Just one, okay, very short one. German law within uh, the uh, term of uh, filing suit, uh, there are n no limit lim limits uh, to curse uh, specific performance, to enforce specific uh, performance. Isn't there any reference to the goodwill? Because if the creditor was not acting in good will because uh, he could enforce uh, performance and uh, could the same result uh, be obtained by reference by referring to the good will that kind of principles uh, exist in the german law don't they yeah good, good, good question i mean obviously we uh, in germany we have a very general principle of good faith and all obligations are subject to the principle of good faith probably one of the first provision every german law student learns section 242 of the german civil uh, civil uh, code but the uh, german uh, courts take a, ra uh, a rather reluctant position on when the principle of good faith would exclude an obligation to be specifically uh, performed it's really rather outrageous cages of abuse. Uh, and I mean, these cases are, the, 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 are rather solved uh, based on the principle of impossibility uh, than on the principle of, of good faith. Be because before you come to the question whether specific performance may violate the principle of good faith, there's always the question may the may uh, performance of the obligation even be impossible and, and therefore no longer be, be owed. And impossibility is a very broad concept. I mean, the easy cases are factual impossibility. You have sold a unique good and there was a fire and the good is destroyed. But in Germany, we also have the, the, the concept of factual impossibility and the textbook case is always you're obliged to deliver a ring, a wedding ring, and it has fallen to the bottom of the ocean. Now. In that case, can you enforce specific performance? And then the question is, well, are these cases not to be treated like cases of factual Im impossibility? 
in German courts would rather solve these cases based on this principle of the obligation having become void because of factual impossibility rather than a uh, principle of good faith, even though the, the result may, may be the same. Let us agree uh, that uh, we have only two questions uh, maximum because uh, we will ha still have uh, time for additional questions after talks. The next speaker is Ilya Nikiforov. Ilya is a very well-known person in, in Russia and internationally. I always admire Ilya how he's able to do so much at the same time. He's a managing partner of famous uh, law firm Begorov Vikinsky, Apanaisev Partners. He lectured at, uh, at the law faculty uh, um, and uh, he's uh, internationally very ac active, uh, being a uh, member of various uh, international organizations, for example, vice president of uh, ICC Commission on Arbitration. His main, uh, main area, among the others, is transnational business transactions and dispute resolutions, and he's very, very much recognized, one of the most recognized uh, the leading international arbitration specialist uh, in, in, in Russia. Um, um, uh, and only one addition uh, more, he was one of the initiators to translate uh, um, DCFR uh, to, to into Russian, and uh, now we have good chance to read uh, to read um, this uh, this uh, most modern uh, uh, book in the uh, uh, area of, of private law in, in Russian language, uh, Madeleine Pravila on European uh, on uh, European private law. So uh, the floor is yours, Hilda. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I will deliver, for those who are English-speaking, uh, my principal presentation in Russia. So please uh, take time to adjust your headsets and so on, uh, tune up to English translation channel. But by, by the way of reciprocity, I must say that uh, nobody properly introduced our moderator. He's much too famous. But I will reciprocate. Uh, Professor Varul not only teaches at the university, he leads an important law firm and takes uh, initiative for some various international projects. And uh, this uh, draft common frame of reference, the prototype of uh, uh, common European private law for the future, or at least law of contracts, uh, Mr. Varul was one of the godfathers of that project uh, in bulk, which we only translated, but uh, uh, in the first place it came into being uh, due to the efforts of a group of people, uh, including Paul. Uh, now to Russian. I'm happy to greet you all in my native beautiful city and we're happy to have uh, the sun. I'll, I'll ask a question about beauty after, after we finish the presentations. But since uh, being a resident of this city, uh, I want to welcome you in this city. When I was preparing uh, my today's presentation, um, you sometimes have an idea or a thought, something that prompts you or triggers uh, you, and uh, you uh, unconsciously start, you know, pondering. And uh, the thought, the idea that triggered me was this uh, thought of how we change the style of thinking, uh, conscious, uh, con consciousness of how young people today perceive the world in a very different way and we, us being, well, half of us being young, our conceptual thinking is changing um, and this understanding, uh, this conceptual thinking of the 20th century is replaced by a new type of this uh, uh, clipping uh, consciousness. People do not, uh, cannot perceive long deliberate uh, uh, and uh, text is overcome is being overcome by visualization so I decided to give you a con uh, s several clips clippings um, and share
share my uh, ideas and my experiences in uh, law enforcement practice. And they fit very well into the framework of our session uh, when we talk about remedies. And the first clipping is early 90s, when Nikiforov, who was a young student, and he was being told that uh, he'll become an experienced lawyer and he'll be bored to death because nobody will treat you as a human being and they, they will only treat you as someone who can be approached for a fast uh, advice, for a quick advice, piece of advice. And uh, uh, well, when they first approach you asking for advice, you feel very proud of yourself. But uh, my, my friends asked me, we bought a computer, a PC, a very rare piece of equipment. Uh, they were uh, rare at that time, uh, but they don't want to, to give it back to us because they have another buyer who offered more money. So I went to Professor Yugorov who told me, how do you prove that they have this computer? And t the terms of reference was, was not to reclaim damages, um, but uh, you couldn't, you know, at that time buy a PC anywhere in St. Petersburg. Uh, they needed this computer to do their project. How do you prove, said Professor Yegorov, that they actually have this PC? And how uh, will you uh, enforce uh, uh, enforce it? And uh, thinking about his words, I realized that specific performance, uh, not everything is okay with specific performance. Courts uh, tend to ignore it, and uh, they uh, uh, they they rather uh, need to f to uh, to prove that uh, uh, that the defendant actually has this uh, equipment, and even if they rule in favor, uh, uh, and uh, uh, rule for enforcement, uh, our bailiffs uh, or court marshals. Uh, don't have the authority to take it back. They can only come to the uh, to the seller and uh, tell him that you know it's not good. You are not uh, uh, performing. So specific performance uh, was a problem in the 90s in Russia. Even now, I mean, me living in a cottage in a village, uh, um, we had a a manager who hid an old tractor uh, and the new manager uh, uh, a new manager hid the tractor sorry and the old manager went to look for this tractor and couldn't find it and he said well we don't have it uh, and the court ruled to examine the territory and they rejected the case because they said well he doesn't have this tractor which means that my first slide refers to transformation of uh, uh, transformation of uh, right of obligation, contractual right. Uh, uh, from the 1st of June, we have new rules for uh, uh, contractual rights. And one of the novelties is uh, if we're talking about civil code, uh, a remedy, uh, uh, an injunction as a remedy, a new remedy uh, in case uh, there are uh, there are liabil there, there's a liab there are liability. You have ten, I have ten minutes. I've spent five mi minutes. Can we have an injunction for 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 Nikiforov to keep mum? If he doesn't, what do we do? Uh, from the list of remedies uh, that uh, Professor Varul had uh, on his second so slide, uh, I didn't uh, find uh, 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 I, I didn't find the injunction, the court order as an as 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 injunction, a specific performance. Um, uh, first, I'll answer the questions when, when I have them. The second clipping from, from uh, my experience, we might discuss it. An interesting case uh, uh, it concerns uh, uh, it concerns uh, forfeit and uh, terms of contract. 
um, uh, supply was not d delivered uh, and uh, the contract provided for a forfeit. Uh, it turned out that, uh, I mean, they had to supply from January to December in 2012. And they didn't supply anything uh, up to December to 2012. So we uh, have a penalty uh, for, uh, f for uh, we uh, incur a contract uh, penalty. But starting from the January of the next year, uh, it stops because the contract uh, is over and supply has been uh, s uh, stopped and thus uh, the additional uh, penalties uh, cannot be recovered. So the this damage, this penalty uh, for the term of contract uh, uh, could be enforced. The rest is uh, it cannot be uh, cannot be recovered. And my question to my colleagues: Can you what can you do about it uh, since the contract uh, date has is expired? Uh, my next uh, slide uh, has more to do with. Uh, specific performance and uh, it's a demonstration of how uh, court practices led to uh, introduction of uh, a French based institution uh, Philip uh, co my colleague professor Philip uh, will probably correct me uh, I'm talking about uh, a strength uh, uh, and uh, for non-performance, court fine uh, imposed by the court. Uh, and it's, it could be an illustration to my first case when they could receive a court fine. In 2014, uh, it, uh, well, the law said that uh, regardless of performance or non-performance, once the court uh, rules, an injunction uh, we may uh, the court may decide to award a sum uh, per each day uh, for each day of delay and uh, it will be painful uh, financially painful for the debtor uh, and uh, uh, if he uh, breaches uh, the court ruling, uh, if uh, the uh, if the uh, complainant or claimant failed to ask for specific performance remedy, he can uh, ask the court to have an additional ruling and award this remedy, additional remedy to him. And today we see that starting from Monday, we uh, a new uh, provision of the civil code, uh, num uh, Article 308.3, uh, about performance, uh, specific performance, and uh, this trend which was first applied in in court it becomes a law and this inst we, we are receiving this institution in Russia uh, we are de-americanizing Russian private law uh, we are retreating from this uh, American model where you can actually breach a contract but once you've paid it's okay uh, and uh, specific performance brings us back to the to our native continental system and uh, 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 DC, uh, paying my tribute to DCFR, I want to uh, pay your attention to, to the first paragraph, which you don't really see, uh, which says that you can claim specific performance uh, if it does not 
uh, proceed from the law or does not proceed from the contract. Uh, uh, well, we understand how it works with the law. As for the contract, we might see a case when larger companies or suppliers uh, might uh, include uh, provisions or clauses uh, that the only uh, remedy for de 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 in defending their civil rights will be uh, monetary well um, you know, monetary compensation or dam damages paid uh, and we exclude uh, specific performance from the contracts and those of you who work uh, in the field who work uh, with uh, industrial um, uh, companies, you may bring this uh, this idea and suggest uh, you include uh, a clause which bans specific performance uh, from your contracts, uh, or. Uh, uh, when uh, would uh, specific performance be uh, be inappropriate? And uh, I would refer to to the document that uh, uh, I mean the CFR that Paul has drafted uh, and his colleagues have drafted. There are three situations three uh, when uh, performance uh, is highly private has a pri as of, is of private character uh, and when you cannot uh, you cannot force uh, anyone for to uh, to do specific performance and the third exception in January 2014, when uh, a higher arbitration court faced an open uh, notion, uh, this open uh, idea in the national legislation, uh, I, I mean the liability uh, obligation to do their best or uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, do their best efforts. But according to the CFR and to framework of European law, uh, this uh, ob uh, obligation, a promise to do their best efforts uh, we understand that uh, by, by, be by best efforts, we understand the efforts that any other uh, person would uh, perform uh, in the same circumstances. So if uh, maybe with time when, uh, not only starting from the 1st of June, uh, when a new uh, amended or uh, civil code will be uh, enacted, I hope that our courts will refer to this new document that we now have in Russian when facing difficult situations. Thanks a lot. As we agreed, two questions right away and then the rest uh, at uh, the Q&A session. If you please. Ilya, will you tell us what's your opinion about the Article 308.3 about the specific performance 397 and 398? Because 397 and 398 provide for the specific performance to be enforced, uh, it uh, is just the obligation to hand over the specific uh, thing. You cannot, uh, it does not uh, cover either the work or service. Doesn't it uh, negate uh, 308.3? Okay.
I think we should uh, act uh, under the assumption you know the answer to the question that you have asked, but the answer that I would like give that uh, the slavery has been abolished in Russia and any activity by the uh, slave drivers uh, are no good. It is not ethical uh, to enforce uh, through proceedings uh, certain things. And uh, this is the case uh, when uh, it is the clause, if uh, otherwise uh, is indicated. So I do not see it is a contradiction, but the personal work and the services fall under the clause if not, if the otherwise, uh, if the otherwise not indicated in the law. Still one more question? Okay, later on, on then. We will still have an opportunity to ask questions. There will be Sunil Kadia. Sunil is a partner of, of well-known uh, um, law firm clearly Gottlieb, Steen and Hamilton in London office. Uh, his main area and the professional interest uh, um, um, related to the English and international commercial litigation and arbitration. Uh, for example, he is uh, ranked as a leading individual in the legal 500 UK, Chambers Global, Chambers UK and Chambers Asia, and is described, for example, as a, one of the leading litigation partners uh, in, in, in London. I am happy to give uh, the floor uh, over to Sonia. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think the first thing to say uh, when you are considering under English law what remedies are available for uh, non-performance is that you need to uh, determine what type of breach you're looking at. Because English law uh, categorizes remedies in accordance with the type of term that has been breached. And there are essentially three types of uh, terms. You have conditions uh, in nominate terms and warranties. And conditions a breach of a condition entitles uh, the other party to terminate uh, the contract or to allow it to continue and uh, claim damages under the uh, contract. And the courts look at the substance rather than form when deciding whether something is a condition or not. So just describing it as a condition in your contract uh, is helpful but by no means uh, determinative. And essentially the more serious uh, the consequence of a breach, uh, the more likely it is that the term is a condition and uh, the party who is injured has the option to terminate. The second category are warranties. A warranty is uh, a contract term whose breach does not give the defaulting party the right uh, to treat the contract as coming to an end and instead the injured party only has a right to damages. And usually warranties apply uh, where they are less important terms or clauses where the impact of the breach will be less uh, material. So statements in a contract about um, uh, factual matters, for example, uh, somebody might warrant that internal approvals for a particular transaction have been provided. That would be a classic uh, warranty. And then you have the third category of innominate terms, uh, which is a term uh, the breach and the remedy for which will depend on the impact and effect of the breach at the time the breach uh, happens. So it's neither a condition nor a warranty. And the remedy it will depend on whether the injured party is deprived of substantially the whole benefit which it was intended he would get. So that's the first thing to, to uh, grapple with. What type of term are you talking about? That will determine what your menu of rights are. Now, uh, let's suppose uh, you uh, have a claim uh, for a breach of, of contract and you want to claim damages either because you only have the right to claim damages or you decide uh, not to terminate the contract and instead pursue a, a claim for damages. What sort of damages do you get? Well, essentially, under English law, the object of damages is to put the party uh, uh, in, in a position that he would have been in had the contract been performed. And English law uh, assesses damages in various different ways depending on what's the most 
a fair outcome. So um, uh, contrast that with uh, torts and civil wrongs where the aim is to put the injured party in the position he would have been if the wrong had not occurred. Uh, the position under contract is, is different. So loss of profits, for example, are regularly claimed under breach of contract, but um, fairly rare under civil uh, tort and, and wrong claims. Expectation-based damages is often uh, one of the uh, uh, most common ways of claiming damages. A party says, I expected to make this amount of profit, you breached a contract, and I am no longer able to, so you must pay me uh, those loss of profits. Another alternative where calculating profits is more difficult is what we call reliance-based. And a classic example of that is an actor agreeing to take part in a TV uh, a film to be made, he doesn't turn up, and uh, the claim for damages by the TV company may be its wasted expenditure because it may be very difficult to determine how much profit would have been made had the actor turned up. And English law basically gives judges quite a lot of flexibility to decide which uh, method is appropriate. Uh, the third uh, thing to say is about agreed damages, and we've heard about um, penalty clauses. English law, uh, like was said earlier under the DCFR, places a lot of emphasis on party autonomy. So parties can agree what is to happen if there's to be a breach. So they can agree that if there's a breach, then an X, a figure of X will be payable. In general, English law upholds that freedom of contract, but there are limitations. And so a penalty clause or a, an agreed uh, a clause for an agreed sum to be payable will be regarded as a penalty and unenforceable if the figure is extravagant and unconscionable in comparison with the loss that's actually been suffered. And so, for example, if the contract provides for the same sum to be paid for a whole range of breaches, then English law is more likely to regard that as an unenforceable penalty clause rather than uh, a, a pre-estimate of loss that is payable under the contract. Some other um, points to mention that may be of interest to uh, an international uh, audience. The English courts can award damages in a foreign currency, but at the date of judgment, the award is converted into sterling. And in days of uh, extreme volatility and exchange rates, that can be uh, incredibly uh, important. And so. What the English courts do is they try to assess the, da the currency in which the damage has been faced or suffered by the injured party. And they take into account a variety of factors, for example, the currency of borrowing, uh, the currency of the day-to-day -day operation of the injured party, and also the contract can provide for uh, the currency. And to give you an example, uh, in one leading case, it was shown that the claimant operated its business only in a Ghanaian, Ghanaian currency. Uh, there were nine years of heavy depreciation of the Ghanaian currency between the date of the alleged loss and the date of judgment. And so uh, the damages would have been around $2.8 million at the time of breach, but because of depreciation, the amount that was actually uh, awarded was only $2,100, because the, cu the, the courts converted at the date of judgment and sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a good strategy to prolong if you're assuming there's going to be a depreciation, which um, uh, is, is a, uh, a regular uh, occurrence in some jurisdictions. A couple of comments to make about interest and tax adjustment, adjustments. English courts can order uh, interest on damages, usually at the rate of LIBOR plus uh, 1 to 4%, uh, although one of the, um, the flip sides of the currency issue we were just discussing is the interest rate can be higher where you've got a, uh, a different currency and so there can be some compensation uh, to reflect the fact that the interest rate will be higher to reflect a different currency. A um, couple of comment to make on taxation. Taxation is also relevant uh, when uh, considering uh, damages because the English courts want to ensure that taxation doesn't put the injured party in a better position than he would have been if the contract had been performed. And that can arise if the local tax system treats damages uh, for breach of contract differently for tax than it would for profits. So if the injured party is going to 
benefit because of a better tax uh, uh, regime for uh, breach of contract damages, the court may take that into account. Uh, something to say about, uh, sorry, just flick th through. Um, something just to mention also about the duty to mitigate. A major uh, limitation on the level of damages that can be available is the duty of mitigate, mitigation. So an injured party can't simply sit uh, on his hands and allow uh, uh, damages to accumulate without doing something. He has a duty to take reasonable steps to minimize his loss. And that will all depend on the circumstances, depend on the facts, but the English courts will look at whether there has been uh, a discharge of that duty and can reduce uh, damages if there hasn't been. There's been some talk about injunctions. Um, uh, we have a, a procedure uh, for interim injunctions uh, so that if you are going to suffer irreparable damage, you can ask the court to order an interim injunction uh, to allow uh, you to get a remedy to either make somebody do something uh, that would have been uh, otherwise a breach of contract or force them uh, to not do something that will be a breach of contract. And the courts uh, take into account uh, various factors in deciding whether to grant an injunction. Firstly, they look at how strong is your case. And ironically, you don't actually have to have a very strong case under English law to get an injunction. People often think you need a really strong case, but actually um, not even 50% in terms of merits would get you an injunction. Then the English courts would look at whether damages would give you an adequate remedy. If they don't, that counts towards an injunction. And they look at something called the balance of convenience, which is basically all the circumstances, what is the fair thing to do, and any special uh, factors that are uh, applicable. So that's a uh, comment on injunctions. I'm just going to make a few comments now on some of the differences between the DSFR and uh, English law. Firstly, uh, specific performance has been something that's been discussed, and we've heard uh, that under the D DS DCFR, you can get specific performance unless there are three things that are present, namely, uh, performance is unlawful or impossible, it's unreasonably uh, burdensome, or it's of a personal character. As we've also heard, English law, Anglo-Saxon law, is different to uh, mm -hmm. continental law. And specific performance is very much a discretionary uh, remedy. And it will not be granted, for example, where damages are an adequate remedy, or, or where performance is impossible, or whether there is delay in seeking uh, the remedy, or where the person against whom you're seeking uh, specific performance will suffer uh, undue hardship. So that's, a, I think, quite a significant difference between English law and the DCFR and other civil law uh, systems. Next point to mention is uh, withholding performance. If the debtor has failed or is expected to fail to perform his obligation, under the DCFR, a creditor has a right to withhold any performance that he's supposed to make, his reciprocal obligation. Under English law, that isn't the case. You've still got to uh, perform your obligation unless you're going to terminate the contract permanently. You don't have an entitlement to withhold performance. A next point of uh, comparison to make is around termination. Under the DCFR, you can terminate uh, for fundamental non-performance, an anticipated non-performance, and an inadequate assurance that performance will be given. You lose the right to terminate if notice is not given within a reasonable time. And either party who's received benefit is obliged to return it unless uh, conforming performance is provided by the other party. As we saw earlier, under English law, the system is different. The right to terminate is very much dependent on the type of term that has been breached. Is it a condition or is it an innominate term? It's only if you've got actual right to terminate that uh, uh, you can terminate. And the next point to make under English law is that the party's primary uh, obligations are completely extinguished from the time of termination. Another point of comparison on price reduction, DCFR provides that a creditor who accepts performance of, of an obligation that doesn't conform to the contract is entitled to reduce the price. Uh, under English law, price reduction 
is only available in limited circumstances in relation to sale of good contracts. So you don't get price reduction on services contracts, for example. And then final uh, point of comparison in relation to damages. Uh, under DCFR, damages are recoverable for economic and non-economic loss. And the measure it will be that to put the creditor as nearly as possible in the position he would have been had the uh, obligation been performed. And limits on recoverability include foreseeability, uh, deductions for any contributory liability, and uh, a duty to take reasonable steps to reduce the damage. Under English law, damages for pure economic loss, unless they are foreseeable, are only recoverable in limited circumstances. Measure, as I mentioned earlier, will be to put the injured party in the position he would have been in, in had the contract been performed. And there are a number of limits on the recoverability, like remoteness, contributory uh, liability, and a duty to take reasonable steps. So I think on this one, there's quite a lot of similarities between uh, English law and DCFR. That's a very quick run through English law and some comparisons. I'd be very happy to take any questions anyone has. Okay. Thank you so much, Sonil. Some questions? Yeah, tell us. Uh, it's a question on uh, the redu price reduction. There is a case uh, in court and uh, the buyer could uh, enforce uh, damage applying uh, general uh, standards uh, and uh, having the right uh, to demand a reduction of price, he can uh, choose which is more beneficial, like uh, seeking damage uh, compensated one amount uh, and uh, the other one is uh, ten times less. Could the English court uh, deny the choice uh, and uh, uh, confirm uh, the uh, remedy which is uh, more economical for the defendant and more fair in the situation. I'd say I think we can make three comments on that. Three commentary. If the injured party has terminated the contract, then um, any uh, rights and obligations under the contract would fall away. So let's assume he hasn't done that. The next question then would be whether the clause uh, is effectively a penalty and unenforceable. So does it give rise to uh, a, 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 an issue that is just the equivalent of a penalty? Uh, and assuming you get over that and that it's a reasonable um, estimate of what should be payable for a breach, then I think the English court would um, stand by the clause and would expect the parties to uh, comply with their obligations because, as, as I mentioned earlier, autonomy is a, a big feature of uh, English contract law. The English courts, the English judges expect parties to stand by their contractual terms. Thanks uh, for the uh, talk. I'm Andrei Zavsky from the Alrot uh, partner. And uh, it's a question that has been asked before. Let me, shall I talk in English? For, to better understand for, the, for our honorable speakers. Let's assume you have a very simple uh, share purchase agreement under which the seller is obliged to sell the share. But uh, transfer of shares is subject to condition of payment of the 100% of the price. So the question is in situation when the seller doesn't want to terminate the contract and would like to receive the full price, whether he's entitled under English law to such remedy. So meaning that he would like to receive the full price from the purchaser. I'm, I'm not 100% sure I've understood that question, but generally if you've got a sale and purchase contract for shares, for example, and uh, the uh, there's a provision for a particular price to be paid under the contract, then the English court would enforce that. Um, you know, as, uh, that's a, it's a very basic uh, clause in a contract that the English courts would, would enforce. Uh, Meaning 
the, the court would issue the award saying that the purchaser is obliged to pay, for example, $1 million for this price, and then it will be obligation of the seller to transfer shares. Uh, I see. So you're talking about prepayment. Uh, I see. I, um, look, if the contract is structured in the way that there is supposed to be prepayment and then uh, uh, the seller uh, uh, performs his part of the obligation, then I think English law would, would enforce that because that's what the parties have agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we move to the next speaker, and the next speaker will be Psevolot Vaipa. Psevolot is a partner of Fuseland uh, Law Offices. He has wide uh, scientific interest. He has a PhD in law. He is associate professor at the Faculty of uh, Law of Higher School of Economics. His special uh, um, areas are civil law, construction law, contract law, as I know, maritime law, insurance law. And I, I may say that uh, Sevolot represents uh, very nicely a new generation of, of excellent uh, Russian lawyers. Please. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, esteemed uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you to the discussion venue, and uh, I think our discussion will be fruitful. Within the time allocated to me, the subject uh, is the standard of proof uh, in the damage uh, cases. And uh, the major problem of uh, the law enforcement uh, practices in Russia regarding losses and damage is that uh, until uh, recently the uh, Russian courts uh, have uh, imparted uh, the burden of uh, proving that the damage was uh, caused, all or nothing. If you prove everything and uh, win, or if you make a mistake or error in, uh, your, in the providing evidence uh, if uh, there is some kind of a mission, you wouldn't get anything at all. And it was a quite pathetic and a sad phenomenon in our court practices. And if you see the court statistics, then 90% of the cases were just related to liquidated damages. You just have to show the breach and the terms of contract related to liquidated damages. And the uh, situations uh, started to change and uh, it was related to the position of the High Court of Arbitration and uh, in one of the precedent uh, cases related uh, to aggressive radar attack it stated the principle the damage uh, should be caused with the reasonable degree of uh, reasonableness uh, no court uh, could uh, demand uh, plan plaintiff uh, to prove it with the degree of 100% uh, uh, surely. There should be some reasonable assumptions uh, that uh, cannot be uh, rejected. And I can say that the English uh, court use even more liberal approach. And uh, in this case, uh, the English law is uh, quite interesting in this case. You just have uh, to have the, uh, the proof of evidence of 50%. It is an uh, unprecedentedly liberal uh, process. Uh, However, incentives were provided by the court of arbitration for the courts to use this kind of approach and it was reflected in the civil code. If uh, you uh, see article 393, you just uh, have uh, to prove the damage uh, beyond reasonable doubt and, uh, and uh, if there is a political will, the standard uh, of uh, proof uh, could uh, cover not only the scope of damage but uh, the factors uh, that limit uh, the amount uh, of uh, compensation. Uh, it is the causal, cause and effect links. Uh, and it is another sad thing. It is not possible to identify global laws uh, uh, that uh, the uh, courts either identify causal relations uh, or no. They uh, can uh, use uh, the 
и proof in, uh, re beyond reasonable doubt and uh, the causal relations. It will be a really a breakthrough in our law enforcement uh, in the preceding practices and uh, I think it is the culture of awarding compensation of damages that define the law and order in uh, a country because uh, uh, remedy for damage is just uh, helping the the countries what they have agreed on but uh, the courts uh, being uh, flexible uh, will mean of how mature the country is and uh, the creditor would know that uh, he can uh, not uh, leave the court with nothing at all and uh, that particular precedent case uh, was uh, resolved uh, by the high court of arbitration in 2011 and uh, there was another approach uh, that the high court of uh, arbitration has defined and it is even more revolutionary than the beyond reasonable uh, doubt uh, proof sometimes it is not even proved that the damage is uh, caused the plaintiff can uh, just uh, demonstrate the fact uh, of damage caused but uh, uh, he can uh, uh, didn't manage uh, to prove uh, and the court uh, should be proactive uh, and uh, uh, w determine the amount that is reasonable and uh, fair depending on the situation and uh, that the measures of liability should uh, be measurable with the breach and the court uh, will have to state that uh, though the damage was not proved the court uh, sh should award uh, the compensations uh, based on the principles of justice and uh, this uh, complies with the international approaches and the same principles uh, exist uh, in the in Midroar, it is an international uh, principle and uh, I must uh, say that it is uh, described in the Russian practices differently, but it is what is worthy to uh, see and what is uh, potentially interesting is uh, that uh, this particular standard that uh, will be applied from the 1st of June opens up uh, new opportunities uh, for the Russian courts uh, to regard uh, the entitlement uh, for the lost uh, uh, chance uh, and uh, the, that kind of compensation is awarded in uh, different jurisdictions. Let me explain the specificity of this institute. It is the compensation that is awarded not uh, when I have uh, lost uh, prof prof missed uh, profit but when I had a favorable condition to earn earn money and it uh, did depend on me not on me and uh, on uh, the defendant uh, but the third parties I was not allowed uh, to participate in the tender and uh, that's why I didn't manage uh, to struck a deal and uh, it is awarded uh, proportionally to the probability of uh, the, this uh, award the Charles Dick the precedent uh, case looked like that there was a beauty contest and uh, one of the contestants uh, was uh, pretty close to get to the final was not uh, allowed to participate uh, because of the mistakes of the organizers it was uh, unlawful uh, it was a wrongdoing and uh, they were supposed uh, to select uh, four out of 50 and uh, her chances were like 25 uh, percent um, correction. She could have been one of the finalists uh, proportionally to being one of the four. So uh, she was uh, not allowed to take part in, in the contest uh, and uh, the court uh, awarded uh, the compensations uh, proportionally to what she could have uh, earned if had she been the winner. And uh, this uh, practice is not uh, allowable in uh, Russian courts like what was the the chance one to ten and here is ten percent it is improbable in uh, Russian courts uh, and uh, even if uh, compensation for the lost chances uh, 
not mentioned. Um, it is the DCFR, the Vienna Convention, which is one of the recognizable standables of international private law. Even these uh, instruments, or other comments uh, to them, and uh, the precedents uh, acknowledge that uh, the principle of uh, total uh, compensation in uh, combination with the principle of uh, if the, there is a demonstration of the uh, damage uh, it is enough for the uh, court on the principles of uh, justice uh, to pay to award compensation with, which is adequate these two uh, rules uh, make it uh, possible to in, be entitled to, to damage and I cannot say that it is a common approach. Not all the jurisdictions where Vienna Convention is applied do that, but at least uh, this uh, is a ground uh, for discussion and it will be quite interesting if uh, we, governed uh, by Article 393, come to court and uh, claim that we had a chance and uh, due to the the wrongdoings uh, of uh, the defendants, uh, we lost our chance and uh, we, uh, uh, we cannot convince you that uh, we could have received uh, the beneficial contract, but we have demonstrated that uh, the losses are there and you, please, it's your discretion of uh, the court uh, to determine how much uh, we could be awarded and uh, what should the court uh, be governed with it is the probability of uh, getting the gains and uh, this uh, is uh, something that the court should govern the by to uh, determine the amount to be uh, awarded. I am skeptical about uh, the Russian courts applying it but there is a probability and the more petitions uh, like uh, that uh, filed, lodged to the courts, the uh, more positive progress uh, could be achieved and uh, it would be good uh, for the justice system of Russia. And another thing, uh, the, we have an article on the obligations, it's not something new for the Russian law, it was uh, always there, it was uh, on the procurement and uh, I think only lazy Russian lawyers uh, that uh, are dealing with uh, damages uh, have uh, cited uh, that the real meaning is uh, of this uh, article is uh, beyond uh, the uh, procurement. It is uh, the uh, article on uh, the compensation of abstract and uh, specific damages. It is uh, in the different instruments, the CFR, Vienna and the others. And uh, it means that if uh, there is a breach uh, of the contract uh, and uh, if uh, there was a substitutional deal buying something from the other supplier, I can uh, get easily get the compensation. I can just uh, show the price that I uh, acquired something uh, for and uh, the price uh, which was in the contract. Uh, the arithmetical uh, subtraction is uh, done and uh, the standard of uh, proof uh, is uh, very simplified. And even if I have not uh, struck another deal and uh, if it is just a market uh, commodity, I don't I don't even have to, that I've been trying to get another one. I can just uh, show the average market price and here is the price uh, of the breached contract, do the subtraction and uh, we can get uh, the damages paid. And that kind of uh, standard uh, makes life easy for the plaintiff and uh, there is no burden for causal relations. You don't have to prove that you've been doing anything for your loss or damage uh, to amount to a certain sum. We do have that kind of uh, general rules in Article 25 of the Civil Code and they, they could be applied if the contract is breached. There is only one reservation. There are two different approaches in principle to uh, what uh, the price is, especially when we are talking about ab abstract losses, when we subtract uh, from the market price uh, or vice versa. What should be the valid uh, price? In English law, where that kind of institute is applied, there is a very simple rule, breach day, 
and uh, the uh, price is uh, determined uh, at the time when the breach uh, took uh, place and uh, there is a rational explanation because uh, in uh, the English law uh, there is uh, an obligation to mitigate uh, losses and as soon as you realize that uh, the contract is breached you should hit to the market and uh, buy another good and, uh, and since you know that you have to do that and because otherwise you, your damage would uh, be reduced it is presumed that uh, any entity would do that that's why English uh, courts uh, uh, award uh, the uh, damages as a difference between the market and the contractual price in our law we have an another approach the market uh, price is determined at the time of termination of the contract and uh, causing a number of problems one unlike uh, other jurisdiction the Russian law does not have uh, a common rule that decides uh, out of court uh, could uh, reject uh, the contract uh, if uh, uh, there is a breach it's not even for the entrepreneurial contracts uh, however it would be logical we can only take matter to court and uh, we it might take uh, a long uh, a lot of time three instances uh, one and a half years that's one thing and uh, consequently you understand that it will affect uh, what uh, price will be taken into account uh, when uh, did, uh, considering the entitlement for uh, damage uh, compensation and uh, since uh, we are referring to termination date in this case uh, the uh, plaintiff uh, con could uh, fix the uh, prices he could uh, look for the market environment for the prices to be as high as possible and uh, to announce uh, the ter termination and uh, uh, thus uh, aggravating the facts uh, for the defendant uh, we do have the principle of good faith covering all uh, the versions uh, of uh, defense of the civil rights and it is uh, possible to defend oneself uh, from actions not done in good faith uh, but uh, there might be some reasonable argumentations why uh, the a plaintiff has been marking time, waiting for the uh, contract to be fulfilled or giving this uh, another chance and this situation cannot be resolved uh, just uh, through farewell and uh, but anyway the burden of uh, proof uh, rests uh, on the parties with the law and uh, it will be e enacted from the 1st of June 2015 Questions? I'm Roman Richling from Intellectus uh, Company. You have been talking about the uh, proof of the burden of proof of the damage, and you haven't referred to the slippery thing, which is a practice in the Russian courts. The Russian courts uh, do not award damage uh, easily, but uh, when this is case is considered, the court says, okay, there was a, a act of omission, but there is no causal relations cause and effect is there any progress uh, made in uh, this uh, area giving the cause and effect because when the court want to refuse they say no cause and effect relation that's it the matter is closed I have uh, touched upon it I think and uh, because uh, the this uh, rule of the reasonable uh, validity could uh, cover the cause and effect uh, relations and the courts uh, can uh, are more flexible now that's the first thing and if the fact of damage is uh, demonstrated then uh, uh, the court uh, should uh, be 
shameful to reject uh, the case, uh, but uh, there are no principal changes in the Russian law, and uh, all those uh, that uh, know the practices and uh, that practice of uh, proving the cause and effect relations are aware that in 90 cases the ruling is just one line. The plaintiff uh, did not prove the existence of the cause and effect, and what should be done when it is uh, binding and the, the courts uh, did not go into that kind of details and uh, the problem is not the law and uh, the unwillingness uh, to court uh, to award uh, compensation of damages uh, is related to the mindsets uh, of the judges if uh, the judges understand uh, that uh, in not in all the cases uh, the greedy plaintiff plaintiffs would uh, like uh, to uh, get uh, illegal uh, gains, uh, then the practice uh, would be positive. It's not uh, a question, but uh, a commentary. In the beginning of uh, my talk, uh, I've, uh, I mentioned that we will get back uh, to the issue of uh, beauty talking about pageant and uh, I know that uh, in the latest work of uh, Sevalos uh, he has uh, been analyzing this uh, issue and the uh, Chaplin versus uh, Hicks uh, case uh, is uh, covered in his talk and the standard of uh, proof in uh, the cases of uh, compensated damage. So I was just uh, wondering whether the standard uh, of uh, proof includes uh, uh, walking on uh, over there in bikini because uh, the judge will have to understand uh, wh whether there is any chance uh, to win or not uh, but it turns out that there is no to prove anything to the judges at all it's just a uh, pure mathematics I'm from Vnesh Ekonok, Ekonom Bank. It's a commentary that uh, everything, not everything is uh, that useless uh, in uh, the judicial systems. And uh, before the amendments were introduced, uh, the bankruptcy uh, case is uh, one of the most advanced uh, regulations. And uh, there is such an option that the creditor has. And if uh, we do not... Uh, talk uh, whether what kind of contractual uh, contracts are uh, if uh, the the creditor can uh, demand the compensation and uh, lodge it uh, to the arbitrator and uh, it is not referred to as uh, the lost chance uh, but uh, in essence uh, it is uh, just what it is so the first step uh, has been made there is a particle there are positive uh, judicial practices uh, and uh, the uh, courts uh, just ask the question, what is the real probability of the satisfaction and uh, meeting the uh, requirements? Uh, if your uh, requirements uh, or, or if you're demanding a damage uh, from uh, the reputable corporation very, uh, with uh, high turnover, your damages will be compensated. But uh, when should it be compensated? When uh, the breach was intentional or due to negligence? Thanks for the question. I will answer in brief. Nothing has changed uh, in the Russian law and there's no need uh, for any change. Uh, the uh, type of guilt uh, did not uh, affect uh, the type of liability and uh, if the guilt uh, might be needed or not uh, and it doesn't matter to determine the liability and uh, the form of uh, guilt uh, should not uh, affect such an exotic uh, compensation as uh, uh, the last uh, chance uh, because uh, applied over here is just uh, arithmetics if you had one chance out of ten you're entitled uh, for ten percent and the, the other things are not important uh, in our law, French and Belgium, uh, the theory of uh, the doctrine of loss of chance is recognized this, uh, and we accept that the judge uh, evaluates himself the percentage uh, of chance.
think it's the same in, in England. And second point, concerning the, the problem of the importance of the guilt, in our law system, the people who uh, commit an intentional uh, fraud uh, as uh, to be uh, more liable than somebody who commit an ordinary fraud. And we apply uh, Latin uh, aphorism, fraus omnia corrompit. Next speaker will be Denis Philippe. I'm really happy that Denis is uh, here with us. He's a real star of uh, Belgium law and, and on the international level as well. He's a professor at the uh, Catholic uh, University of Leuven and visiting professor of some other universities and is managing a partner of uh, his own law firm, very well-known law firm in uh, Belgium in Europe, uh, Philippe and Partners. There is a long list of, of international organizations uh, where he is uh, active. Uh, only two points. Uh, he is uh, um, uh, um, a member of the Council of the European uh, Law Institute and at the same time a uh, founding member of that uh, institute. And by the way, Denise was a member of the study group on the European Civil Code. That study group uh, elaborated and, and prepared uh, uh, this famous DCFR uh, we are talking about. It means that Denise is one of the co-authors of, of DCFR as well. Please, the floor is yours, Denise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a bit, I'm not told this, that's the reason why I prefer to uh, to stand up and I hope so that uh, I can see uh, everyone. Uh, maybe the slides? Uh, I was supposed to speak about uh, French and Belgian law. I will, but uh, I don't want, I know that I will be one of the last speakers. Thus, I don't want to repeat what other people say. Thus, I will concentrate on French and Belgian law. It's better. Then uh, I think it's important uh, for you to have some uh, overview of international uh, commercial law, and I will see some aspect of uh, the Vienna Convention. Every one of you uh, applies this convention, thus it's important to uh, have the, the elements of uh, this law. And third, uh, as you know, as Paul said, uh, we uh, work for the creation of. Uh, Belgian of a European of a European law to our project for the creation of European law and I think it's interesting to uh, uh, give some aspects and to see especially the relation between what was said until now and uh, this uh, this project of Europe this first uh, I think that I'm also a lawyer since uh, uh, decennia, I think that the problem of non-performance is a very important problem in the practice. When I receive a case, one case of two uh, puts a problem of non-performance. This is very important, and I give you an example. In uh, the Napoleon uh, Civil Code, we had a provision that said that only the judge can terminate the contract. That's mentioned in this Article 1148, very important article. But of course, this article creates a, an important practical problem because in my country, you have to wait for a six, seven years before to having a decision of the judge. That means that during seven years, you have a partners you don't want to work with. This is a real problem. That means that this article was practically speaking uh, not feasible. This, the judge was aware of that, and they tried in Belgium, uh, in France, in Luxembourg to create some artificial solution. They say, no, it will be possible in such and such circumstances, but nothing was clear. And we were the sole country where the intervention of the judge was always necessary. And uh, what is very uh, important also, that's something new, maybe you don't know, is that in France, uh, next year, there will be a new civil code. US, we have the Napoleon Civil Code of 1804, and now, two centuries later, we have a new civil code. That's a very important point. And in this new uh, civil code, the termination by notification of the contract will be possible. This is uh, it's great news for us. 
uh, because now it comes to legal predictability. And uh, what is also important to say is that now the French-Belgian solution, the Russian solution, the solution of the DCFR, all these solutions are harmonized. The conditions are something sometimes different. But the main principles are the same in all the, the countries. And I think that's something very important because there is a better coherence between the practice, the logics, and uh, the law. That's for this, uh, this first uh, topic. Uh, some uh, elements which are also important uh, concerning uh, French and naval law. Specific performance uh, exists in our country since uh, Napoleon, this is, but it's a very important principle. All my colleagues uh, explain why this principle was very, uh, very important. Uh, once more, a case uh, from the practice. Your uh, seller does not deliver the goods, thus you have the possibility to go before the referee judge in an urgent procedure, and you ask him uh, to order to your seller to deliver the goods for the 1st of uh, June, for instance, with a judicial penalty astreinte of, uh, let's say, uh, in, in Belgium, we can have an astreinte of 1 million euro. This, that is very efficient. That's really uh, the basis of the specific performance. Your, your law is efficient, and that's one of the most important things in law. The law is efficient. This specific performance uh, is important. and like our uh, English colleagues say, specific performance uh, is uh, not so uh, important in England. But I think for us it's important, very efficient. But of course, like we, uh, our colleague uh, Mr. Schmidt says, it's not, uh, you cannot ask specific performance every time. Just there are some limits. I will not enter into detail because uh, our colleague do that better than I could do it. Uh, but in the French draft, it, you cannot ask specific performance whether it's impossible. That's, uh, that's logical. And the second uh, condition is more controversial. When the costs are excessive, that means if the, the costs are three times higher than the, uh, the damages, you cannot ask a specific performance. That's also logical, but in France, uh, some uh, people are reluctant for this reform of the civil codes. Maybe it's due to the fact that this is a socialist uh, country, a socialist government, I don't know. But anyway, uh, this condition is subject to some, uh, uh, some controversy. In our country, uh, Belgium is uh, more uh, simple. You cannot ask uh, specific performance whether it's amusing. There are other conditions that I try to give you and to focus on the most uh, important uh, then, in uh, most of the world country, the Vienna Convention on the Sales of Goods is recognized. This, and this convention was negotiated by more than 100 countries, and the solution uh, which are to be found in the convention, this solution, are very interesting because it's really the first step towards the harmonization of uh, contract law. That's the reason why I think it's important to, to uh, remind the main uh, principle of this law. Of course, for the termination, you can terminate in case of material breach. What is uh, material breach in this convention? It's Article 25. You need two elements. Material breach means that the contract has no value anymore for uh, the creditor. Uh, let's say you order uh, goods for a dinner for the first of uh, the 30, the first of June, and uh, the, the, the the service provider comes only the second of June. Of course, the press the, it has no value anymore because uh, the dinner is over. This, uh, that's that's uh, deprived of uh, the value. And second point, which is uh, uh, really an equilibrium, is that uh, if the debtor did not know that it was important, then in this case there is no material breach. You have always to inform your debtor of the consequences of this. That's the two uh, elements of material breach, but. When there is a material breach, you notify and then the contract comes to an end. Very, uh, uh, very simple solution. And in all the systems of law, this solution of the Vienna Convention is now present. This is something also very, uh, very important. Uh, there are some, uh, some, some uh, details what differs, but that's the two, the value of the contract and the foreseeability for the debtor. Then uh, for damages, always in the Vienna Convention, uh, the damage, uh, the, I think we did not speak about that until now, the damage to be compensated need to be foreseeable. That's, uh, that's something very important. I will only give an, uh, an example. 
you, uh, I am the buyer, I buy a good from the seller at 100. But fortunately for me, I have the possibility to resell the same goods at 400. So we'll make a very big profit. Let's assume that my seller did not deliver on time and I cannot deliver to uh, my uh, client. In this case, the logics in Belgian law is to say, uh, then I ask the pay repayment of my damage, I ask 400 because it's uh, the 300, so the, the difference. That's logical. But in law, in the Vienna Convention, in the DCFR or uh, French law, the damage must be forcible. What does it mean? That means that your uh, the first seller must be aware that you have the opportunity to resell at 300, uh, uh, at 400, and what you buy at 100. Uh, if he's not aware of that, then he can say, sorry, the damage was not possible. You are only entitled to the normal, ordinary market price, let's say 200. This is your own subjective profit that you can expect, but which is not foreseeable for the debtor, in case for the seller, you cannot ask for that. This, that's uh, something uh, very important also in the, in the practice. We, we, uh, we have a lot of cases concerning this. Does that mean that it's important to know this, uh, this notion of foreseeable damage? Then second point, which is also important, we do not speak ab ab about that until now, but only uh, very, uh, uh, very rapidly, is the anticipatory breach. Uh, anticipatory breach, that means that if you uh, the, the seller has to deliver on the 1st uh, of June, but you know already on the 15th of May that he will not deliver, you can already put the contract to an end. That's an important principle. And this principle of the Vienna Convention, you find it back in the DCFR, in uh, the, the, all the, the international instruments, and also in the new uh, French law. If this principle has been uh, admitted in the new French law, it, it is because it's a new very efficient rule of law, and this rule of law is now part of the modern uh, law all over the world. Mitigation of damage, you already speak about uh, mitigation of damage, that's uh, also a general principle, you have to mitigate the damage when you can, uh, that's, that's uh, logical. And I don't mention another principle which is also important, is price reduction. You receive goods, you, you are okay with the goods, but it's not the good color, not really the good quality, in this case, uh, the Vienna Convention, but also the new French law, and all, a lot of uh, the, the DCFR are, uh, allowed the, 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 the buyer to reduce the price. And you say, but it's logical, everybody do that in the practice, but it's, when it is not mentioned in the, in the civil code, you are in an unsecure situation. No, it is mentioned in the main uh, modern instrument of law, and it's also something very important for the practice. Then a very interesting topic is the interest in case of non-payment in international states. Uh, you are in Russia, I am in uh, Belgium. Uh, you have to uh, deliver a good, I have to pay the price. I do not pay the price. How will the interest be calculated? There are a lot of uh, possibilities. The interest, are the interest there is nothing in the Vienna Convention. I think that the parties could not find a compromise on this. That's a pity, but that's the reality. Which is the law applicable? The judge, let's say that's the Swiss judge who had to, to uh, settle that. Will he apply the, the interests of uh, Swiss law? Is that the law of the contract? You apply uh, uh, Russian law? Will you apply the Russian interest? Uh, or do you will apply an international rate? This, uh, for me, and I wrote a lot of articles on this, I think the Vienna Convention uh, want to promote international trade. And to promote international trade, the best is to have international interests. That means that, as mentioned here, we have now at our disposal international interests. The LIBOR, which is an interest who is uh, quoted uh, on the London market. The LIBOR is an interest recognized all over the world. No, it's not very high, it's 2%. But uh, in the promotion of international trade, it is better to have international interest. So you have a lot of possibilities. You can wrote uh, books and books on this because the possibilities are very high. But I think, like in the, the, the CFR, like uh, in the unit war principle, we have to try to find 
uh, very interest interest were uh, recognized all over the world and were economically uh, uh, grounded. That's that's my, my uh, message concerning uh, the uh, the interest. Then very shortly, uh, as you know, there are a lot of uh, instruments to promote. In, uh, harmonization of law in Europe. This harmonization is also important for Russia and for all of the countries because it's an harmonization of the principles who are recognized all over the world. My colleagues here uh, told me that uh, also the Russian Supreme Court applies the DCFR uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, that means that the work was, uh, was uh, well done and in uh, the continuation of the DCFR uh, Ms. Reading, who was vice president of the commission, appoints a group of experts who drafted a uh, law especially for sales. And this, uh, this project was terminated. This project has been approved by a very large majority by uh, the European uh, Parliament. And then uh, it was a pity, it was considered in the January 2015 not to be uh, the most pri important priority of uh, the European Commission, and now this project must be extended to di digital services. What is also something important, we need uh, something for digital services, but this project is important because it was approved by the European uh, Parliament. That means that all the rules what were in these uh, documents are also very important. And I terminate my, uh, my, my, my speech by saying that uh, what strikes me when I read all this project is that uh, the rules concerning non-performance are more or less the same all over the world. These rules are in general very efficient and correspond to what we need in uh, the practice. There are other points which are also important for the, uh, the legal predictability, but if we have uh, a good economic uh, reasoning, good economic grounds for these rules, if uh, these rules are also uh, logic and current, uh, I think that all these rules go in the same direction. We have a lot of uh, uh, points to say that there are divergences in the, in the world, but I think these rules on non-performance can be an element for a better uh, understanding between, uh, between people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have some quick questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question about French law. Uh, yeah. How would you resolve a situation if using French law? Say uh, a customer ordered two ships to be built. One is almost uh, one is built, the other is almost built. According to French law, how could you ask for specific performance? Uh, or could you ask for the ready ship, the ship which is ready to be delivered to you? Or could you ask for the second ship to be delivered as well? You know, I'm not a Frenchman, but I can answer. Uh, you know the answer as I do. This, uh, in French contract law, uh, the solution is uh, evident. Uh, a witty, uh, a witty uh, question and a witty contract, answer. The contract must be performed. Uh, that's, uh, So I, I'm just curious, um, the biggest jurisdiction in the world that has not signed, I still believe, the Vienna Convention is Britain, England. We're not a signatory, I think. Isn't that right, still, of the Vienna Convention? Actually, I did, there's a reason why I checked that not long ago. And yet, English lawyers were very evolved in drafting the Vienna Convention. And here we are many years on. And I just wonder, obviously it doesn't register with you as a point, but it, I just think it's a bit ironic that, um, that we're not a signatory. That's also a, a good question. Uh, but you know, I try in my, in my speech, I think it's important for us to have uh, opinions and to, uh, uh, to, 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 we have also to, to deliver a, an, uh, not an ethical, but a personal message in, uh, in what we say. 
this, uh, I think that a lot of uh, industrialized country preferred the previous convention, the A convention, in place of the Vienna convention, because they have the impression that uh, the uh, the developing country have a too, too important role because there are some rules who uh, favor the the, 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 the the buyer for technological products. For instance, they have a fairly longer time to uh, protest in case of uh, defects and so on and so on. And does that mean that uh, the countries who are very liberal, uh, they refused, that uh, Portugal also uh, refused uh, the, the signature, that's uh, that's a pity. Uh, I don't know, but the, the states accept. Uh, that, that I think for me it's a it's a pity. It's a really a, really a pity. And the second point, which is also uh, uh, very sad, is that in all the industrial contracts, this most of the industrial federation excludes the Vienna Convention. And that's also for me. It's also uh, very sad, but that's uh, that's a reality. And uh, when I make a conference on the Vienna Convention, I always say uh, this convention is good. That what I said now, uh, because there are a lot of very good aspects in the convention, but uh, you know that's uh, more or less uh, ideological, and I think that uh, some things would things that not not in their favor, but we can only uh, fight against. It. We are on the time pressure, and we, we have to move the uh, next and the last uh, uh, speaker will be uh, Pavel Menchenin. Uh, Pavel is a legal expert of Moscow City Power del Credere. Uh, uh, being practitioner, he has a uh, um, wide uh, uh, scientific interests. He gives uh, seminar and lectures for practitioners. He has um, uh, scientific interests uh, primarily uh, related to the uh, particular issues uh, of the law of publications, um, having a uh, lot of uh, uh, publications, uh, but, uh, namely in this area. Pavel, please, uh, floor is yours. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for your introduction. My short uh, presentation is uh, uh, termination of contract, and I'll probably uh, uh, point out certain aspects that were not uh, not uh, seen to in the reform um, uh, of this law in Russia. First is limitations, and the second point is consequences. Limitations, constraints, is the first my first point. In European legislations, you don't have uh, provisions, uh, well, you don't have a situation when a, a creditor would have no constraints or limitations to terminate a contract. If uh, uh, if he had, uh, if you had those limitations, uh, for example, a debtor uh, uh, didn't pay one day for a credit, you can terminate the contract. Uh, it doesn't sound plausible, but in, uh, uh, you have uh, constraints or limitations for uh, creditors. Uh, we can uh, divide them into three groups, those limitations. I'm not taking uh, Russian law, but I'm taking European approaches. The first limitation is uh, material breach. The second limitation uh, is a knockfrist uh, mechanism when you can uh, terminate a contract uh, uh, after you give time to perform uh, to the data. And the third limitation is uh, uh, creditor acting in good faith. Let's talk about material breach. I would like to start uh, uh, by explaining what a material breach would uh, would mean, that in Russia, uh, at least uh, as the civil code uh, provides, uh, material breach is considered to be uh, there's only one provision for material breach. If we look at the Vienna Convention or if we look at the DCFR or the European principles uh, for contract law, you would see two aspects of material breach. Uh, what would be uh, 
one and the same. Well, the material breach uh, is material only in the case when a creditor, uh, to a large extent, loses uh, something he could uh, expect after termination. If uh, there's only one day delay in credit payments, well, May Bank, being a larger credit organization, wouldn't feel it as a burden. Although, in practice, you often see banks trying to terminate credit agreements uh, because uh, there was one day delay. Uh, you have mortgage uh, and uh, uh, but the but the the courts would deny termination because there's no material breach. So this uh, uh, you have this uh, both in Russian law and in European law. Uh, the second. Uh, uh, the second uh, characteristic. Uh, we don't have it in the civil code in Russia. Uh, my, I want to see if you have it in, in law in general. What would be the second uh, characteristic of breach being material? What do we mean by bad outcome for a creditor? A debtor should have foreseen uh, the gravity of the, uh, of the outcome. In civil code, you don't have this provision, but uh, there was a case in the presidium of the highest uh, higher arbitration court when uh, the damages case, not a termination case, uh, was ruled uh, because they both uh, had foreseeable for, for, for a principle of uh, the, sorry. Uh, the highest court uh, ruled that the debtor must have foreseen uh, the damages. And uh, so uh, foreseeableness is an element in, uh, at play. So maybe Russian law uh, will uh, refer to this case uh, in the future and refer to the European law in this regard, uh, this foreseeableness uh, principle is being criticized. Uh, speaking of material, uh, in, uh, yeah, we, uh, this reform does not help us solve the following issue. Uh, this breach being material, does it refer to the cases when, uh, uh, when there is room for unilateral termination? For example, the contract says that the creditor can uh, terminate an agreement if there has been a delay. A creditor uh, was delayed payment for two or three days, and he breached, he terminates the contract. Uh, today we see many, well, a number of cases, and sometimes court uh, try to say no, uh, even if there is a clause for any delay in the contract. Uh, the courts now tend to see if there has been a material material breach or a, a, a big, a longer delay. Uh, uh, the second limitation is a mechanism of uh, it, it means that you can terminate a contract uh, without uh, going to court only if the creditor gives time extra time to the debtor to perform the contract. We don't have this mechanism now. I mean, it has not been uh, uh, implemented. Uh, it is, we're talking about uh, unilateral uh, procedure without judicial procedure. Uh, it's a very good uh, way of resolving uh, a dispute, uh, uh, the creditor simply gives a debtor time to perform the contract, uh, and after that they can terminate it. 
uh, it could be, well, we have kind of nakhrist in Russian law. According to, I mean, if you terminate it uh, in court, uh, the creditor still has to come to the debtor and offer them to terminate it uh, without judicial procedure. Uh, you can't go to court at once. You have to visit a, a debtor, and this, w this impedes contract termination uh, within Russian law. Uh, and uh, another impediment uh, is uh, uh, a creditor uh, acting uh, dishonestly or not acting in good faith, acting in bad faith. Uh, see a, let's see a situation. You have a dealer agreement between a large uh, seller of uh, cars and a large uh, dealing company, one of Russia's largest dealing companies, distribution companies. And for some reason, uh, the manufacturer of cars would like to terminate the contract. And then in the dealer contract, you have a clause providing for termination uh, without any special preconditions. A Russian dealer goes to court saying, uh, uh, telling the court that uh, they have been performing well, uh, we are selling well, we are one of the largest dealers in Russia, while the creditor would like to terminate the contract uh, without providing any evidence, without showing uh, why they were unhappy with dealer's performance. And uh, uh, there was a case when uh, and the manufacturer, that manufacturer was acting in bad faith because for, uh, for uh, the manufacturer this contract was profitable, while for a dealer uh, it would mean uh, huge, dam huge losses because they would need to find another manufacturer. And now let's see the consequences of termination. Uh, the consequences are probably the most urgent issue in the Russian law. Why uh, would a contract be terminate, terminated? Uh, it, when it, a contract is terminated, we need to balance the relations between the parties. And the first civil code uh, in its provisions uh, well provided that uh, the consequences of termination uh, uh, terminate uh, rights and liabilities of the parties. What did the, the court say in these cases? You creditor, you have paid your counteragent uh, in advance. They did not perform and you terminate the contract. Now you cannot get your advance payment back. Uh, look at the civil code. All liabilities and all obligations, all rights are terminated. Well, that's your problem that you terminated right now. Uh, the courts realized that this was unfair and, and offered three uh, legal tools uh, enabling to uh, re regain this balance. It's damages and liquid li 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 liquidation requirement and uh, and unjustifiable enrichment. Damages uh, do, do not allow to balance the interests. Uh, I'll give an example. Damages is a mechanism that uh, only helps uh, the uh, suffering party to regain the balance. Uh, like, for example, in leasing agreements, when a leasing company terminates an agreement, uh, gets uh, back 50% of their leasing payments, gets the, the leasing object itself, and the debtor uh, cannot use the damages mechanism to uh, regain his rights because he breached uh, uh, the contract. And uh, well, the courts realized that uh, unjustifiable enrichment may serve to, uh, to, to, gain, uh, to regain the balance. Uh, the latest reduction of the, of the, uh, the latest version of the civil code 
не написано в законе или не, не следует из договора. Uh, for, uh, so, нет, unjustifiable, unjustifiable enrichment or unreasonable gains. Uh, this theory uh, is not perfect, and I will tell you why uh, it does not help to, uh, uh, to attain justice. Uh, let's say a uh, rent agreement. Uh, after rent agreement has been terminated, uh, a tenant would use this property. Eventually, when the owner or the, the property owner got his property back, uh, what would be the amount? Uh, what would be the damages? Uh, how will this uh, penalty be paid? Uh, if we're talking about if we're talking about uh, forfeits or um, uh, forfeit penalty, uh, the judges uh, refer to unjustifiable enrichment provision. Uh, they say they w we uh, we would uh, apply uh, we won't apply uh, contract forfeit penalty. We will apply uh, penalty ac according to the civil law. Law. We are uh, like in, in, the in the tenant or uh, in the rent agreement. How do we calculate uh, your payments? Uh, uh, if we, we do calculate payments using the agreement and we calculate the losses or the penalties using something else, how can we use uh, average market calculations if, we're, uh, if we have two sums to calculate? And uh, the new reduction of the uh, civil code uh, does not provide for the following case: the, b the bank terminates a credit uh, agreement because they're not pay they're not receiving payments. Uh, uh, you have questions about mortgage. What do we do with the mortgage? What do we have? Uh, uh, what do we have with the, to do with the penalty? And the court is unable to give. Uh, uh, well, the, the court gives contradictory rulings uh, because they they cannot calculate the penalty the penalty using the contract because the contract has been terminated. If the contract has been terminated, uh, it means that uh, it means that uh, its uh, guarantee, uh, warranty, its warranty uh, has expired. I think we still have a lot to work on, and uh, this is basically what I wanted to say about contract termination, but you see that there is still a lot of work to be done. Thank you uh, for for a presentation. Uh, maybe we could uh, I mean, we have to wrap up, but uh, maybe a question or two or a comment. Uh, maybe a comment. Uh, if not, we're um, we've been working a lot today. Uh, it Thank you much, uh, all uh, speakers and, uh, and uh, the participants, presentations and, and, and uh, questions. Uh, спасибо всем большое. Thank you very much.